excited to be here today. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's how I get the ice broken so that we don't get too nervous, so that we can understand that everybody's a friendly face here in the room. So, yes, yeah, so I'm Spencer Douglas, the Chief Marketing Officer of BZI. And um, like Tyler said, we, we reach a lot further than you might think. And, and so as far as BZI Steel, you know that we do something with steel. But I've got a real quick video that I wanted to show first. And then I have um, a slide that I'm going to show. Then we'll let Tom take it away. So Tom's one of our founders. And, and he's got some fantastic stories. And hopefully you guys have a lot of great questions for him because this will go a lot more fun that way for us. So without further ado, here's a little bit about who we are. When we stepped in the market, we've challenged the way that it's always been and have found a lot of opportunity to make it better and more efficient, whether it's processes or connection designs, the way that the material flows into the project, the way the project sequence, there's a lot of opportunity to bring innovation to, to this sector. We're a young company, and a lot of people look at that and, and hesitate. But what we have brought and what we continue to bring to the industry is excellence in our innovation and in our safety. Our safety culture, we take pride in that. As a team, we, we work together to build a building injury-free, incident-free, that's our goal. If there's a solution, if there's something that's not being done safe or something that could remove some steps and streamline the process, everybody knows there's, there's an avenue to go to not only improve process, but even engineer, design, you know, develop new equipment to make that process better. Novatech works side by side with BCI at the testing bed. We work together get the feedback loop happening. We really feel like it's a perfect recipe for perfecting the product. It's been embedded deep into our culture to innovate and find better processes and better ways. The first thing that it's got to check is, is it going to make it safer? Many times we innovate just for safety and actually the net result is we pick up mass efficiency as well. You get both the safety benefit and the efficiency benefit. Every day we learn something different and BZI is on top of passing on that knowledge so we're all informed. It's, it works pretty great. When these guys sets foot on the job, they don't have to worry. And that's a big thing in construction. The ease of working with BZI, I think, is second to none. We say we're going to do something, we're going to figure out how to do it, whether that means extra hours, weekends, extra people, resource. We're going to make a commitment, we take it serious, and I think that's important. We're not just a steel erection company. We are a construction innovation company, a building systems innovation company, and, and that's what we bring to the market. So, this did, you, did anybody see anything that was kind of like, oh wow, I didn't know that they would be that, right? So I'm gonna tell just a quick overview of where we're at right now today as a company. Tom will jump right in and kind of tell you where we started. And that's, that's the interesting thing about it. So I'm gonna use the pointer right here. So over the last 12 months, 18 months, we've actually received some pretty prestigious accolades and recognition as a company. This one's a big one right here, the Steel Erector Safety Award. Um, this isn't just an award that happens by accident. We have to be a safe company in order for that to happen. Um, this one right here, Leadership Excellence, this is a prestigious award given out to only five people in the entire country who are leading their organization, whether they're for-profit or non-profit, it's the Malcolm Baldridge Award. If you're ever interested in that award, there's some pretty big heavy hitters out there in the world who've done some groundbreaking discoveries and leadership changes as a part of the Malcolm Baldridge Award. There's a few others. I won't go into depth on those. But this one was kind of fun. Of the 5,000 fastest growing companies in the whole country, 
we ranked 1,795, which doesn't seem like a big deal, but out of 5,000, we're in the, in the top 1,700. In Utah, we were number 40, and in Cedar City, we were number one. So, kind of a, kind of a fun thing. So, we have over 750 team members. Many of them live and work right here in Iron County, and a lot of them work from coast to coast. So we're spread all over the country. And we have a whole different variety of industries that we work in. So electric vehicles, battery manufacturing, food and, uh, food and beverage, microchip plants, um, data centers. So some of the stuff that we work on and are building, you will probably eat a hamburger or have cheese on your hamburger or your phone may have chips that were manufactured here in America in buildings that we're building. Um, and even cold storage and warehouse. So there's, you kind of see the heat map here. These are projects that we've done all across, all across the country. And we've erected a little over 126 million square feet of buildings since 2017. If you were to pin that down into acreage, we've covered almost 3,000 acres of land with industrial buildings that have been built for all of these different types of industries. So it's a pretty big deal. And it wasn't always this fabulous, so to speak. You're, you're looking at a company that's, that's come a long way since 2006. And so without further ado, I want to bring my man Tom Harker up and have him tell the rest of the story. Because Thomas has been there from the very beginning. I literally joined a year ago and have been the chief marketing officer for about a year now. And Thomas, take it away from the ground floor. First off, I need some tech support. Oh yeah, I can fix that. You can go ahead and, there we go. Nice. So first of all, guys, ladies and gentlemen, rather, I'm uh, excited to be here. And maybe I'll uh, start by when I first uh, met Mr. Tyler here. I think that's your name, right? That's right. Anyway, uh, met him over lunch one day. Somebody introduced us. And uh, he had this bad idea to talk me into coming in and talking. So my disclaimer is I actually, you guys are the smart people here. This is my first time into a, a college. I've never went through high school. You guys know a lot more than me about everything. So I'm going to tell you and I'm going to expose myself a little in many of the big mistakes that I've made in my journey that hopefully by the time we're done, it can bring value to you guys and your journey perhaps. So with that disclaimer in mind, um, if, if it doesn't work out, just get with Tyler and make sure he's more selective on the, the future people he brings in. So. <clears throat> A couple of things I wanted to share. Um, obviously in school, it, it's a good thing. It, it trains us in a lot of ways. But I think in the real world, there's perhaps some lessons that we may not get without, I'll call it real world experience. So I want to share some of my mistakes and the lessons I've learned the hard way and help potentially pay the tuition for you guys and hopefully you can learn from it. <clears throat> so. Part of my message today is there's in difficulty, there lies opportunity. So if everything was easy, we wouldn't be pushed out of our comfort zones um, and likely we wouldn't grow. So with that, this slide here is the beginning, 2006. So a little bit about myself. Um, I grew up out west of Cedar here out in Burley, Utah. My, my grandfather's farm was out there. Um, we, we lived in a world where work was plentiful and resources were few. So we had to learn to be creative and use our time wisely and be creative with what we had because we didn't just have a lot of money to go buy all the, all the nice stuff. So that's part of the, the history. On the family farm, it, it grew and uh, there came a point where there was more people than the farm could support. So we started by you know, building, building our own hay sheds and barns and got to be where we would be kind of the go-to for the local community there, build their hay sheds, their barns, and it kind of started out from there. <clears throat> Just 
Spencer, your thing isn't working. There we go. It's not working on the screen. Well. At least I have an excuse why it don't work, because I've never went to school to run a computer. <laughs> you can go ahead and keep talking. I'll make it, I'll make it happen. I might have to end, and then I'm going to go from right here. All right, so we went from building pole barns in about 2006, 7 and 8. Obviously, there was anybody that's familiar with the markets. Basically, all the money dried up. The market kind of crashed. And there was very few projects that went through that time frame. We went too far. Yep, my bad. Anyway, so we got into building a lot of uh, retail centers. So primarily in the western half of the United States. We got in with some of the contractors, Walmart, Kroger, Lowe's, and built literally scores of those across the nation. So with that, we, uh, we learned a lot and made a lot of valuable uh, connections with the, the contractors. So this little uh, yellow cart there, I have a story to tell about that, that big, big lesson for BZI. So in about 2014, 15, Walmart went from building, opening about a store a day to literally not building anything. That was our primary um, work at the time. We did a lot of Walmarts. We were kind of in with them and built many, many Walmarts. Well, all of a sudden, it seemed like overnight, the Walmarts shut down. Well, what they did is, is they had a program where they put their money into refurbishing some stores. They had um, went into a bunch of existing stores and was doing some enhancements to their, their stores. So we were fortunate with our connections to get invited to participate on those. In the beginning, then it was not a very desirable project. We would go into these open stores. Bear in mind, you have people coming in and they're shopping. You're, you're barricading off aisles. You're welding in an open store and uh, covering all the merchandise with blankets. When you pull the blanket off, half the shelf comes down and breaks the bottles. And, and uh, we strung cords from back in there their back power boxes and all through the aisles and tried to not trip people. Anyway, very undesirable. We're in, this, in these stores and we're doing, at the first it was like six stores that we, we got. Well, by the time we were done doing that, it's like, yeah, this is a lot of headache, you know. People that weren't very happy and the store was a mess and you're working all night. Just a pretty undesirable uh, environment. Well, we also realized there's it's a challenging situation, but there's huge opportunity if we have the mi right mindset. So we, uh, after a long night, me and my brother are like, yeah, this is uh, not very cool. Let's see what we can do to make this a little better. So he came up. He's a, he's a genius. We're out on the farm and don't have very much things to work with. So it's like, hey, let's build a cordless welder. Well, that sounds pretty funny, and everybody laughed at first. Well, about three nights later, we went to the local auto sh uh, store, bought a bunch of batteries, took the local Walmart cart, put all these batteries in there and had all these cables and things tied together and it looked like a miniature bomb rolling in. So anyhow, <laughs> the uh, Walmart store manager didn't think that was very nice and shut that down right away. So this yellow cart is called the Mobile Arc. That was a big lesson for us. One of the things we learned is the difference between in the farm and then out in the, in the public, in the real world. Presentation is important. So we learned it needed to be presentable. And actually, some people make you get certifications and all those things to bring in, into their store. So this is our mobile arc. We got a little more presentable. It is a little cart that has batter, a battery bank in the bottom, an inverter, small welder. And we took an opportunity that would literally take you two nights to go in and set up just to run your cords and leads. And then we made to where you can have a hitch, you put that on the back of your scissor lift, drive wherever you want, put out these barricades, and you can be welding in 15 minutes. So it took days worth of prep work, and we managed the safety, we're more effective, efficient, and the nature of those projects were some stores might only have five locations you need to get into, so you'd spend most of your time preparing for it, and then in this case, you eliminate the prep time and you're ready to go. You would charge them during the day, we would work at night. They have reels on there for your leads and different things. So that was a, 
By the time we were done, we visited over a thousand stores in 49 states in the United States. Um, we didn't go to Hawaii. But very, very profitable thing for us. We figured out, we, we broke the code to the challenge more or less. Go ahead. Do you manufacture these and sell these? Oh, we do manufacture them. We haven't actually taken them to market, but we have some. Are you planning on it? There's a need. We're, we're open-minded. So anyway, that's kind of the beginning. So with that, the, the key lesson there is there's, there's opportunity to succeed even in challenging environments. Some of the times, the hardest things you face can end up being the greatest blessing if you take it with the right attitude and come up with a solution. So that's my story about that. So that was kind of the, we'll call it the bedrock for what we know today as a Novatech. So early on, Innovatech was basically part of our field teams that uh, we come up with a good idea and it's like we would go home to the shop and build some things and anyway, after we got some momentum, then we actually built a dedicated team. We have today, we have engineers, all the, all the people that, that build our proprietary equipment. So, <clears throat> From the JEP days, that's where we use the mobile arc. Um, 2016 was a pretty transformational year for BZI. So that was a year, a group of us, um, we bought out the, the original founder. He decided he wanted to go back and have an easy life and go farming. So we took the hard road and went into construction. But it wasn't always that easy. There was days back in 2008 where we, uh, called the team together, it was like 15 of us, and uh, decided we were in too much debt, we should probably wrap this thing up and do something more productive. We owed more in taxes than we had in, in our uh, balance sheet. So anyway, we decided we didn't have any other options to keep going, so we did. So <clears throat> in, in 2016, pretty transformational, a group of us bought out the founder and then all of our historical work had kind of dr dried up. So we decided, hey, wh what's our future? At the time, 2016 BZI was into a little bit of everything. We were into a little bit of farming, a little bit of real estate, some joist enhancement projects, spray foam, pre-engineered buildings, some concrete, a little bit of dirt. Anyway, so we got together and we said, we need to define ourselves. Who are we and what are we about? So at that point, we got together and we decided we're going to, as our, as our core values, we're going to focus on making it amazing for our people. So high value earning opportunity and make a positive impact on our communities was kind of what it was built around. And we decided, hey, we feel like there's opportunity in the uh, steel erection market. We are going to go and revolutionize the steel erection business. Bear in mind, coming from some little farmers, that was a, an audacious goal. But we set out to do it. And right there, there's a picture of what we call our, our panel table. If you look at it, there's two sides to it. You pre-manufacture these panel roof sections. On one side, you're setting the joists in. On the other side there, we have this arm that carries the deck across. And you nail the deck down. So you can be working on both sides of it at the same time. Similar to, it's like bringing manufacturing to the field is really what this does. So that panel table, it's a big unit. Those sections that are, you can see going up are about 1,500 square feet, if that gives you some perspective. That panel table has a drive system and it drives along with the crane to where it, it's always in, in reach of the crane. So that was our original system. And uh, we did a lot, of, a lot of high boxes all over the United States. Well, 28 come, 2018 comes around and there's bigger challenges. You guys, I'm sure, are all familiar with Amazon. They're pretty uh, amazing when you need to order something. Anyway, they needed somebody to build their buildings. And they were very tall and very, very complex. And they had five floors of mezzanines that, had, that were built out of I-beams. So you see those beams? So the traditional way they would erect those was be to do it with a crane, start at the bottom, do one floor at a time, go all the way up. And we're like, man, that's just a lot of work. You would have to hand deck everything, a lot of exposure, a lot of your people working up at heights. Anyway, 
we decided there's got to be a better way. So it's like, how, how, do we, how do we adapt to what we have and panelize a mezzanine? Well, at the time, it was a, talking to the people in the industry, they would think we were insane. They're like, you can't just do that. Like, how would you? When we even went to panelize, they're like, nobody panelizes with deck because how do you get everything straight and all this? Well, we were too dumb to think that it couldn't be done, so we tried it and figured it out. And so, I guess in a sense, it gave us a little bit of confidence that we can, we can figure this out too. So, when we first took our first contract, we sold the people on, on an idea. It had never been done before, but we said, hey, we'll, we'll come in and, and do this and meet your schedule. Um, it was a little bit challenging to explain to them how we would do it because nothing had ever been built, but our boss is a good salesman. Apparently, he got us the job. Anyway, so by the time we had built our Mesmaster, that is a attachment on the, on the front of a big forklift that can, can tilt on like a 45 degree angle and drive around. It's a big forklift, 24,000 pound machine. We had to work closely with extreme manufacturing. They build the forklift, we built the attachment, we worked closely together and came up with that concept. So that, that was another big lunge for us. Um, it turned out to be very successful, so successful, we decided, hey, you know what, let's convert that to joists, which is typically used in the roof, and that'll eliminate the crane. So we adapted it to that, and it's been a very successful thing. So with all these innovations, it would continue to propel as we gain efficiency. And one of the greatest things with this system is instead of having all your people exposed at fall hazards, all of this work primarily is done under six feet off the ground. So you don't have to be tied off and you're very efficient and productive on the ground and you just have to have a few people go up and do the final connection. So you're saving exposure and picking up mass efficiency gains as well as managing the safety very effectively. This here is called an RTV. We uh, named it the rooftop vehicle. Well, so the traditional erectors would climb out on the, the, there's a girder right there and you see the ends of the joists. The traditional erectors would get up there and walk that joist, being tied off to it, and then drag hundreds of feet of lead, welding lead, up there. Anyway, that was uh, a lot of work and we decided there's gotta be a better way. So we came up with this. You would uh, probably smile to see our first version. It was like this little cart that you push along and you're straddling this gap in the deck. Anyway, this is our latest, one of our later models. This vehicle can drive along the edge of the deck. It's on a high flotation uh, tires. So there's, it don't point load the deck. Has a welding machine and you can see that basket will de, uh, It'll, it'll de-elevate the welder down to the perfect place for making that final connection. So we have a number of those, but one by one we would add whatever the, with our process, whatever the pinch point was, we would try to eliminate that. Every job we have what we call lessons learned meeting. So at the end of the job, it's like get the team together. What went well? What didn't go well? Where do we need to put our focus to make this better? And maybe right now is a good time to ask is there uh, any questions by chance? Do you guys manufacture those and sell those? <laughs> we do manufacture them. So all of the equipment you see that's the uh, orange and tan, right, we, we build that in-house. It's actually right out here west of Cedar. Um, all in-house, we engineer it, design it, fabricate it. Do you have it? We do. Okay, are you guys going to sell it as a You know, if there's a market for it, I'm a pretty open-minded fellow. You can underbid everybody. Go ahead. That's what I'm saying. What's like your time frame from when you like meet a problem and when you end up with something like this? Great question. So maybe I will divert a little bit from our slideshow and I'll talk about a lesson that is going to help answer his question. So one of the things that we found in our school of hard knocks, I'll call it, is uh, there's millions of opportunities every day for innovation and different things. So since we had farmer backgrounds, we thought it'd be good to get into building sprouts. Anyway, one day we were down to the, the farm show down in California. We ran across this guy that had this little sprout machine that in six days it would take it from weed or uh, from seed to wheat, like about that tall, six inches tall or whatever. And he'd just this little manual process. 
Anyway, he was telling us, yeah, if we could automate this, um, like I have all these customers out there. Well, we're like, why, that'd be pretty simple, you know, you can just automate something, make some belts and a few things and, and get it to go. So we were trusting this guy to basically be our marketing guy. Well, this is back when BZI is relatively small and a dollar was, went a lot further than it does today. So a group of us got together and we invested. <clears throat> Two million dollars later, we had the third generation prototype. The first one was like we took a, a semi-trailer, like a reefer box, put si uh, seven layers of belts in it that would advance a certain amount and had this little drip system, all the right lighting and everything to get it to grow good. Anyway, first generation we learned a lot, second generation learned more. Third generation was a full-on unit that you could take your phone, hit a button, and it would harvest. Come up off this conveyor belt, dump into your, like a couple of tons of feed every day. So we got the system figured out. Very automated, amazing. Well, turns out the only problem is, is he was having a really hard time selling the big dairies on it because there wasn't the data behind it to, uh, they didn't know what to do to their cows. Long story short, the lesson we learned out of that is I don't doubt all of us can go achieve whatever we put our minds to, but in, in the real world, you need to be successful. It seems like it's been our experience. You need a customer for all of your good ideas. So you can build the coolest thing in the world, but if you don't have a buyer, it's probably not the best thing to put your money into. So to further answer your question, we have implemented a, a process. Before we'll dump any money into an innovation, we have to know how we're going to get the money back. So since there's been many opportunities like that, then it's, we have to have a contract before we will build something. If it's like a support machine like this, we know that we can go and get contracts that can justify that, and it's easy math. Over time, we'll save X amount of man hours, and it's an investment. So does that answer your question? Yeah. So we have to have a contract before we'll put a money, any money into something. Go ahead. How long were you operating in the red before you guys became profitable? <laughs> That's a great question. I don't, I don't know all of the numbers, but it was some, uh, a lot of pretty meager years. I would say 2015-16 is really when things started to pick up for us, when we could actually make a paycheck on time and not have to, you know, talk our guys into staying. So that's... And up to that point, how much had you personally invested? Sure. So up to 2015, I was just one of the dudes on the crew that uh, helped make things happen. Um, 2016 is when, when we bought out the initial, original founder. But I was, I guess you could say, one of the lead people that would go lead the teams. So initially it was uh, four or five of us that actually started. Um, at the time I was a relatively young fellow. So does that answer your question? Yeah. Anybody else? If not, hey, we'll keep going. So this is a, a great thing to further answer your question. So what you see right there is what we call a sky brace. So as the buildings have got taller and taller, it was challenging to brace them. So anybody that understands traditional steel erection, it's traditionally braced with uh, like a, a web of cable, cable bracing that goes between the bays. So our first prototype like that, we had 27 miles of 7 eighths cable going like this massive web throughout the building that was very labor intensive and a lot of work. Well, we decided once this, so that was the prototype before this was barely shorter, this building went taller. That roof is close to 100 feet tall right there. And we decided, hey, we uh, don't really like running cable around. So we decided to build a sky brace. So that's a two-part brace system that we built um, and manufacture and use proprietarily on our projects that will, you can brace from the exterior of the building. Now the interior of your building, you have full access in and out of all the bays. So that is a total game changer. And it, I, I don't remember the exact amount of days, but like less than two months, we came up with the idea and then it was delivered to the site. So we have in-house engineering teams and people that are willing to work during the night and all the things to, to make our crazy ideas come true. <clears throat> so, as we, uh, it's been our nature to 
to solve problems, right, in the industry. It seems like you, you get out there and you understand what the, what the issues are. And uh, it's been our experience that if you learn how to solve problems, then bigger problems come your way. And in the real world, they, they actually pay you to solve their problems. It's kind of crazy. Go ahead. How many people are on your design team? Uh, so we have like 55 dedicated people at Innovatech. That's all they do is innovate. So what are the OSHA things, you guys? Uh, <laughs> they, uh, there's some pretty big fans. I will say OSHA is deeply steeped in tradition. So they're not exactly super open-minded to new ideas, but we're working through it. <laughs> Go ahead. So along those lines, how do you get the clearance to do what you're doing when OSHA stands in the way? So it's not easy. I'll tell you that right now. Um, some states are more stringent than others. For example, California. Uh, we've, we've had to change our approach due to some technicalities that we just end up working around. Um, we have a, a great team, training team, that understands the rules really well. And that's a part of our process anytime we go to implement a new system, is to make sure it's checking all those boxes. Um, OSHA also has provisions to where you can go in and, and petition. So we're working all those things, but we don't let that hold us up. Go ahead. No, no. So m maybe I need to touch on that a little bit more. Let's say, to, to briefly summarize, from 20, 2006 to, let's say, 2014, very meager years where we were lucky to make payroll. 2015 and 16, we got into the JEPs. That was the contract I told you about with the little mobile arc. That was probably the, the big single project that, that gave us a leg up to where we could build our first panel table the cost us. I remember our budget was eighty thousand dollars, and uh, we were very successful in blowing that by like four times. So, anyway, once you're so far in, you can't stop, right? So you just finished it, and uh, it's been a relatively slow growth up until that point. But the JEP contract with Walmart was definitely a a booster, we'll call it, to our growth. Go ahead. How did you guys get that contract? Sure. So it came with with relationships. Um, in the retail center, retail market. Um, bear in mind at the time, nobody wanted that contract. There was actually a number of other people that were like, oh, I'll never do another one of those. So it wasn't a desirable project at the time, but we uh, took it and made success out of it. Go ahead. Because you did those ones, like, you get the good ones now, I guess, like the Amazon. Well, we, like we figured out how to make them good. Let's put it that way. Okay. At least try. So over time, you, you add what you learn and, and hopefully get out ahead of some of the, the previous mistakes you've made. So off of those projects that were quote unquote a previous mistake, do you take those jobs now and make them successful? Sure, so even now today we, we pick and choose the, the jobs that are the best fit for us. Um, we've definitely learned a lot and most of the mistakes that we've made in the past, we've, we've engineered out those risks in, in many ways. So we still look for the, the projects that are the best fit for us. Go ahead. So where are your limits as far as what you guys are building? For instance, gigafactories, <coughs> things of that magnitude. Are you guys wanting to stay relatively small for retail size, or do you want to go skyscraper direction? What is your kind of goal? Sure. So I would like to say we don't have limits. But uh, actually, there's, there's certain prototypes that we feel like our systems are the best suited for. And if you don't mind, there, there's some slides coming up that I'll touch on that and hopefully I'll circle back around if those don't answer your question. Anything else right off? So, no, that's good. This is another innovation. We recently, some of you may have seen this machine out here a couple of weeks ago. This is called Traxzilla. It is something that came, we hatched it up out of uh, an idea one day. We were flying on an airplane and there was a spare napkin, so we started sketching on it. Anyway, my brother, he's, he's the brains behind this. Um, as those Amazons got higher and higher, then it's like, it's what would really be nice is to eliminate the crane, because there's a lot of constraints that come with using a crane. So it's like, let's just build a bigger forklift. Well, there wasn't a bigger forklift, so we actually partnered with Extreme Manufacturing on this big boy. 
It's a 5100, and that stands for 50,000 pounds. It'll reach 100 feet high. So with this, we'll be able to set a panel at a at 10,000 pound panel at 100 feet high. And its boom cycle is about 30 seconds, so very agile machine, and it's an absolute beast. Probably wouldn't want to get in the way of that one. How much does that cost? Uh, we're finalizing the numbers, but we're a little north of two million on that one. <laughs> yeah. Say what? What's the maintenance like? Well, if I'm if I'm to be honest, we we barely took delivery of it when it was out here. Okay, so that's is it barely just being used? So we actually haven't made it to the job with that one. Wow. But uh, it, it's a new item that they're finished programming with our new. We have a new attachment. We call it the Mesmaster 200, that makes the uh, so the payload much more. So we're we're finalizing the programming on that, and then we'll ship it out to the job. Go ahead. So you need a forklift certification for that? You do. <laughs> you actually do a, 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 a special one. You're up there. No, so technically uh, you only have to have a crane one if, if you're, you're hanging something with a hoist. So Why are you guys using tracks and not wheels? Great question. A couple of reasons, actually. So that is spreading out the weight. By the time you get 100 feet out with 10,000 pounds, extreme pressure on your front tires, it would crush the slab. This, you're, you're spreading that weight out, weight distribution to where now even on a concrete slab of say eight inches, um, depending on what it's specced at, then you, that's actually less uh, pounds per square foot than a normal forklift with the way that the weight is distributed. Okay. So. When you guys are using that, when you guys install it, do you just raise it up to the required height and then weld it in and then how do you release the wall? Great question. So as a part of that attachment, it has these jaws. You go up underneath this panel, it'll clamp it, and then you can tilt it, go between the columns, then go up and you set it. You have a connector on each side, they'll put it, bolts in each thing, then you release that clamp and come down. Okay. Go ahead. You guys also own Extreme as well? Do we own them? Yeah, like manufacturing. I know you do a lot of work with them now. So we own 120 units, but we don't actually own them. We're pretty good friends with their uh, owner though. So they've, they've custom built many machines for us. So we have, a, we have a nice fleet of them. But we do rebuild them out to our factory. We'll strip them clear down and uh, refurbish them. How are we doing for time? When do I need to wrap this up? You got uh, five, six minutes. Five, six minutes, I'm gonna have to make it quick. So this is our uh, fabrication line. And I'm gonna tell a little, the moral of the story behind this one real quick. It's going to deviate a little bit from the initial time frame. So 2015, um, as things were a little shaky on the BZI side, my brother and I were thinking, man, it'd be pretty nice to have a little more security. So we decided there was this little bumper business that we knew. We decided we would uh, venture out and buy the, the three bumper drawings that they had and a couple welders and make us a bumper business. And that would be kind of our stability as we were going through uncertain times. Well, it turns out we uh, rented a shop, brought some more welders in, hired a, a drawing guy that drew more modern bumpers, and we actually figured out how to make bumpers. But the only problem is we uh, didn't learn the Sprout Tech lesson, and we realized we needed customers for our bumpers. So one day we wake up, and bear in mind we're just employees at this point, so we didn't just have a lot of money. We wake up, and we're in debt $250,000. We've went to every show that we can think of, and it's almost like we can't even give these bumpers away. Well, at the time, we kind of had a, a bias toward fab shops. We didn't think they were very nice because the ones that we knew were these grungy, dirty, depressing places to work. So we never thought the fabrication would be a good idea. Well, it turns out, I happened to be over in Oregon at the time. We're doing a big warehouse. And the guy didn't have his roof frames there in time for us to panelize. So I talked the guy into giving me the roof frame package which uh, he did, and that little package kind of saved our bacon on the, uh, the bumper shop. And that kind of shifted our mindset that says, hey, maybe uh, fabrication isn't such a bad idea. So we got together and it's like, hey, let's uh, just do miscellaneous still for a little bit here until bumpers pick up. Well, we quickly realized that bumpers weren't for us and we went into miscellaneous fabrication. And very quickly, with our relationships on the BZI side, we started getting a lot of miscellaneous packages for the still side. 
Well, as the story goes, it came a point where it was a little bit of a conflict of interest because um, some of us were partners in the um, bumper business and partners in BZI, and then others were only partners in BZI. So we ended up selling out to BZI, and uh, we went from ground zero and built an all-new fab shop with the latest technology, and today we're uh, shipping still all over the nation. In fact, we have a massive job in Georgia right now that's being fabricated out of this shop. So, quick lesson there, the moral of the story, is uh, you can build the best product, but in the real world, if you cannot take that to market, you might wanna reconsider. So, go ahead, Spencer. Real quick, this is uh, Still Tech Academy. Um, as our company was growing, historically we did on-the-job training. Well, we quick, quickly realized as we're gonna scale, we kind of needed a little more formal training process, so we uh, built what we call Steel Tech Academy. Um, any new hire, what, regardless of where they come from, all, all over the United States or even foreign people at times, will come into here before they ever hit the job, spend an intense one to two weeks in training, and they'll, they'll come out with certifications to drive equipment, welder certifications, um, basic instructions on how to read drawings, just the basics that you need to get out onto the job. So that's what this is, and that's owned by BZI as well. So 2023, oh, go ahead. This is kind of where we've been. <clears throat> so a couple of things, um, we'll call it the lessons, lessons learned. Over the years, a lot of people have said that we're, uh, we're just lucky which I will be the first one to say we've been very fortunate and very blessed. But with that, we've had to take some risks, we've taken some hard knocks, and we've worked really hard. So I guess you could say that uh, luck attracts, you know, hard work attracts good luck, you might say. So, where are we today? This is a shot of a project we have in Georgia. That's some of our fleet of extremes, by the way. Um, the, the project in the back to the right is a 3,000 acre site <clears> that <throat> we're primarily building all the buildings there. It's a new Hyundai plant, EV vehicles that they're building over in Savannah, Georgia. Massive, massive build out and uh, that, that, project, that uh, photo is a little bit old, old now but we're uh, currently, Spencer touched on some of the markets that we serve. We work nationwide employ a lot of people, and this is the business we're in. We build buildings and create good teams, and there's some more slides. Go ahead, Spencer. Fun fact, this building and this building will actually be connected together. That's how big that is. Wow. It'll blow your mind. If you ever get bored, come out to Savannah, we'll show you around. Who's the general on that? Uh, so it's called HEA, Hyundai Engineering America. So. How does this impact us today? <clears throat> this is basically a, a photo of, of the design of our new build out west of Cedar here. This is our transloading facility. Um, I know that we're about to run over our six minutes, but I'll make it quick. Why did we build the, why, why all this? So I'll tell a quick short story. Um, as all the mills for the steel are in the east, you have to derail the, the steel in. Well, there's no transloading facilities in Cedar City, so we had to either go to Phoenix or Salt Lake to a transloading facility, load it on semis, and bring it in. And we're like, yeah, that's uh, very redundant and a lot of extra money. So we went shopping around for maybe 30 acres to build our new facility that had rail access. Well, we couldn't find 30 acres, but we found 400 acres, and it's like, well, since there's that much, we went and bought that, and there's another 400 next to it, so we just went ahead and got that. And we're building it an overall development, and all this is going to be rail-served lots. It's gonna change the game in the local communities. Hopefully everybody will have greater earning opportunity. And if you're like me, you hope that you're, uh, if you ever have kids, you hope that they're gonna stay local, right? And add value to your community. So the idea here is we want it to bring value back to all of us and give us great opportunity to continue to live an amazing life right here in Utah. So that is in the works. This 
transloading facility is already here. Um, this is our new BZI headquarters. We plan to start construction early next year on that one. We're uh, currently finalizing the design. And uh, that's a, a shot of our team. So I know we're running close on time, but is there any uh, questions? Go ahead. That big facility that's going to be connected with rail lines, is that what you're, you're going to like lease out sections of it to other companies to then utilize the rail system in that way? Sure. So, so it's actually a kind of two-part thing. We're going to bring our new facilities in there. We have plans for a new fab shop and, and a number of other things. Um, we're going to anchor the site with our own projects, and then we're going to build to suit for other uh, customers as well. So right now there's very limited opportunity for people that need the transloading uh, function, but now even the local farmers, if they need hay onto the rail, different things, we'll provide that service. Cement, powder, all that stuff can come right into our facility. We will facilitate that, and then with that there's going to need to be distribution centers, um, other manufacturing plants are going to be attracted in now that there's that service available. So that, that may not be exactly what it looks like, but that's the rendering of what, what we have drawn in today. So this is the stuff that you were talking about. You had to outsource from Salt Lake or Vegas, you said? So that's the transloading f facility. So our fabrication facility builds projects for all over the nation. And we had to freight the steel back from the East Coast because that's where the mills are. So this will be able to freight it right into our facility. There will be a train terminal right into our fab shop when we're done. So you're hoping we become kind of what those other big facilities currently are in the West. You want to make Cedar City become that? Somewhat. We don't, we don't want to take over because some of those facilities are not that great, but we just want to bring the, the best ones in. So our goal is to, to make life amazing for our people. Great opportunity. Go ahead. Um, you and your brother are obviously very intelligent and innovative, where do you think you guys got those qualities from? Is it from the farm? <coughs> is it from on-hand experience? Or where do you think you got those skills? So I think that's a great question. Um, I don't know that I have all the answers, but I will say learning to appreciate what you have is a good start. Working hard, and then also maybe we're just lazy enough that we want to find an easier way, <laughs> is probably a part of the combination. And then uh, I can't thank my Obviously, parents and grandparents, the environment I grew up in. Um, how much time have we got left, or are we there? You can wrap up this question. OK. So. Well, sorry, let me jump in. We've got spots for lunch. You can, you can ask many more questions. we got lunch. So go ahead and wrap this up, and then we'll, we'll call it. So maybe, maybe I'll just wrap up with a, a, key, a few key thoughts in life. <clears throat> So I'll, I'll go back to my, uh, my, my farming roots here a little bit. I think a lot of times we're, we're confused in the world with money and how we define success and what that even is. So I'll go back to the, my grandfather saying, he says that the law of the harvest is that you'll reap what you sow. So I think there's a, a lot of lessons in that. What we put out will return. And... Uh, so I think a few key, key things we've learned with, uh, in my journey with BZI. Keep your commitments. Treat others the way you want to be treated. So that means be honest. Even if you need to take full ownership of a mistake, that's what you do. Even if you look really stupid, right? You, it is what it is. That's how you learn from it. If you ignore your problems, guess what? You're going to be a fake all of your life. And it'll always be somebody else's problem, so we never learn. So I'm a big fan of, hey, be, be proud of them. Don't want to repeat them, because that's not a very good idea either. But use them to learn, right? And then don't be afraid to share those experiences. Focus on bringing value, not money. The value, the money will be a reflection of the value that you bring. So a lot of times you can be nearsighted and get greedy because it's about the money. But at the end of the day, if you bring solutions, the money is just going to happen. So take, take the high road. Um, in business, it's very, very tied to relationships. So the importance to don't burn bridges, take good care of your people, and be a positive impact for the things that you believe in. And I think that uh, the rest will happen. So that's all I got, and I appreciate it, guys. You guys are a, a good crowd, and thank you.